let's talk about kind of the UV spectrum, UV light, red light, blue light, infrared, where all of that fits and kind of the clinical benefits that we're seeing with, with uh, getting the right dosages of these. Absolutely. So there's, there's, uh, we've, we've actually approached this a little bit different uh, in, in a different manner than a lot of the photobiomodulation or light therapy uh, companies in the market. Um, I, I think what we've seen, aside from a couple of really kind of uh, uh, leading edge clinical device companies, is that most companies are working off of engineering uh, specs for uh, things like irradiance and uh, power density, uh, which is essentially how much light is being put out or how much light is being, how much light is landing at the at the skin level, for lack of a better term. But we what we've done with this to to kind of improve the dosing is instead of working on the light side, let's work on where that light's going. Uh, so let's let's start backwards from uh, these photo acceptor reservoirs that we have at different levels of tissue. And when we have those, when we know those photo acceptors uh, are, and we know at what level of tissue we need to access them, and then we know what wavelengths we are able to to output, then we can work backwards to to kind of model. And this is this is where we've spent tens of thousands of hours with our uh, physiology and, and technical teams is modeling, mathematically modeling how we're delivering light at these different reservoir levels um, and, and which uh, knowing which molecules you're interacting with and how you're triggering them and then being able to put a feedback loop into that from a, an outcome standpoint is something that's been really useful for us. Uh, and we, we track um, a number of different things in the space. So one of the, the key photo acceptors that we work with is heme proteins. So in, in specific hemoglobin. Um, there's a binding site in hemoglobin, obviously for oxygen. Um, what's, what's not really understood about, uh, uh, the hemoglobin interactions that, that a lot of these companies are having is this is a competitive site with oxygen and nitric oxide binding to the same place. And so when we can interact with that, uh, hemoglobin and reduce the affinity of nitric oxide for that binding site, not only do you dump nitric oxide into your blood, which is great for your endothelial health, it also increases the size of the, uh, the blood vessels in the area. Uh, through dilation, it also offers a new binding site for oxygen, and so you're you're kind of getting a, a double whammy from a, a a synergistic approach for how you want to deliver this oxygen and, and other nutrients back into the space. But what we see with that is that it's it has a huge impact, particularly on inflammation. So if you have chronic inflammation in a joint or in soft tissue, uh, being able to increase the blood flow and oxygen delivery to that space has been really, really effective. And because we're targeting that with these specific wavelengths and these specific power levels that trigger the reservoirs in the optimal way, we're really kind of optimizing the outcomes that we're seeing with all of our users uh, relative to that. So um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a an approach that I think hopefully we'll see other companies start taking as well. It's it's really heavy from a an investment and resource standpoint to go build these models. But when you have them, then you understand what you're actually triggering and doing within the physiology versus just kind of looking at the the product and, and uh, light output specs, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. To summarize that, so heme, which is this iron binding protein in the red blood cell, we know that hemoglobin obviously uh, has oxygen, right? So it connects to oxygen and releases oxygen into cells. And it also connects, it also uh, binds to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, when it's bound in the heme, it competes with oxygen. So it, it reduces the amount of oxygen binding capacity. But when it's released, now it gets out into the plasma and it has this dilation effect uh, where, where it helps the um, endothelial lining of the blood vessel to dilate which allows more blood flow to get into certain regions. And of course, it also now doesn't compete with oxygen because it's out in the plasma. So now more oxygen can bind in the heme and now more oxygen can be delivered to the various tissues that, uh, that, that are being impacted there. And what you're saying is that red and infrared light, that exposure has that impact of taking of getting nitric oxide out of the heme and into the blood, into the bloodstream and allowing for that improved oxygen carrying capacity, oxygen dif diffusion uh, into the cells, improved endothelial function. So you get this anti-inflammatory and uh, improved oxygenating effect. 
That's exactly right. And and you know the the wild thing is that it's not just the the hemoglobin. So you've got you've got other uh, kind of heme heme proteins in your uh, in your body that are are impacted as well. One amazing thing about the body, and the more that you see it, and and uh, I think you talk about this quite a bit as well, is everything in your body is not just performing one uh, one function. It has the the core function that uh, that it may perform, but it also has signaling functions uh, that it that it has relative to. Um, Kind of concentrations and, and uh, downstream uh, effects that it will it will um, it will trigger as well. And so one of the things that we're seeing with that is so aside from just delivering blood the blood to the area better and, and more oxygen to the area, uh, another of the heme proteins that we interact with, um, particularly with our infrared, and we we found this with the red to a degree, but it's 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 harder to penetrate into the internal tissue with the red that our infrared has been really doing a great job of is interacting with the cytochrome C oxidase. Uh, so there's a there's a uh, a heme core in this in this area as well, which is essentially, um, and this this goes a little bit technical, but um, it's a step in the oxidative phosphorylation chain uh, embedded in the mitochondrial uh, phospholipid bilayer. So the the walls of the mitochondria have these uh, these steps where you, uh, embedded in them, these molecules embedded in them that help to process and uh, create energy. And there are bottlenecks in these, and these bottlenecks have to do with these same type of binding sites where they're competitive. Well, it come, come to find out this is another binding site that's both oxygen and nitric oxide competitive, and that when we can release nitric oxide that these, uh, from we can reduce the affinity of nitric oxide for these binding sites, that this area of the mitochondria becomes more effective. And so your oxidative phosphorylation chain being more effective is something that is both beneficial for you from a an energy generation standpoint, but there's also communication uh, based on that energy generation. So um, again, coming back to the idea of everything having multiple purposes, these molecules that are created um, and that are are kind of side products of the uh, byproducts of the uh, ATP generation, the energy generation from the mitochondria, uh, are also signaling molecules in your cells, and so. Uh, one of the things that we've seen that's really powerful uh, for our users from a, a, a pain and inflammation standpoint is reducing oxidative stress. Uh, so the downstream effects of these these mitochondrial, it, it sounds great to to have more uh, energy out of your mitochondria, and it is. And, and we we actually, we work with some top tier athletes uh, and, and having faster recovery is something that puts people into much better space from a competitive standpoint. But what we're super excited about is being able to reduce inflammation uh, for our general users versus necessarily the, the competitive professional athletes. And that oxidative stress impact is one of the big ways of doing that. Yeah, powerful stuff. So it improves cytochrome P450 activity within the mitochondria, which improves ATP function, right? So ATP production reduces overall oxidative stress. And we know oxidative stress is a precursor to inflammation. More oxidative stress drives up inflammation. So if we bring down that oxidative stress, we improve uh, inflammatory levels.